Welcome in to this edition of the show from the shoe. I'm your host, Dan Herbner. Sitting alongside me is my co-host, colleague, co-worker, whatever you want to call him, but his real name is Colin Hossel. How Thank you, you very much. You got that right. That's I absolutely did. Very just many, many titles, many titles for you. Anyways, Ohio State over the weekend, 128 to 3, and what happened to be one of the most boring games I've ever watched in my life. Over the fighting Illini of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. Yeah, we're going we're gonna spend my, spend a lot of time on this. It is uh, one of many boring games for Ohio State this year, and finally, Ohio State's actually gonna play some good competition. Yep, we it's finally get to get into the time. real season. Uh, but it, uh, they're ten and zero, so that's just all you could have hoped for yeah. if you're an Ohio State fan. That's what you wanted going out of last season, and now you got it. And in the entire year, I've been saying that. Really, Ohio State's season starts in the in their 11th game of the year. It's going to be Michigan State, Michigan, and then whoever they play in the Big Ten Championship, provided that they win both of those games. And pretty much the season is played out exactly as everyone expected. Am I wrong on that? Like, there's at no point in the season was there a point where I think a lot of people thought, Ohio State, really, like, they're going to get tested by Penn State. Like, one person may have said that at some point, but... I, I never really felt that there was any competition. I would like to let the record know that nobody else felt the same way. You were definitely the only person who said that the season started this week, but good for you, man. You were right. Thanks a lot. I, I really take really take some honor in that. What takeaways did you have from this game? I know that you were in West Virginia, but I know you also watched the game over again. So did you have any takeaways? Let's get through it real well, quick. Well, Texas is a really bad football team. I got, I got, I got that in uh, Morgantown. But okay. from the Ohio State game, we learned that Ezekiel Elliott is as, as good as he's been, and we didn't really learn much because of that. But at least, <clears throat> at least he is who he is. Joey Bosa is who he is. Michael Thomas, another great game. Basically, we learned that the Buckeyes are very good right now, and they're healthy, and that's pretty much what Urban Meyer wanted coming into this game. The only issue that I had coming out of this game is that Ohio State did have trouble with pass protection throughout the game. JT Barrett was getting pressure up the middle. The one interception that he threw, he was hit, and the ball just kind of fluttered to a defender. Coming up against Michigan State and Michigan, two teams with very good pass rushes, especially Michigan State. Michigan State's got a lot of talented guys up front. That's something... That'll be an area of concern for Urban Meyer that he needs to get corrected come starting this week. He has, to, I mean, the pass pro has to be a lot better, especially because Ohio State should be able to exploit Michigan State's secondary, which has not been very good throughout the season. So basically we didn't learn anything is what we've no, both been trying to say. Correct, but also there's still worries about the pass, yeah, pass protection, which is which is a big concern. It is a big concern, especially going into this week. But, but other than that, you know, everything else was fine. The is, defense played great. Joey Post was getting triple teamed at times throughout the game, and he just absolutely dominated. Ezekiel Elliott runs again for over 100, 181. Ohio State takes over in the second half and gets a win. So, anyways, let's just move real quick through these playoff rankings, which came out this week. Ohio State sticking at number three in the country. That's where they've been since the original rankings came out. Clemson 1, Bama 2, Notre Dame 4. That's your top four with mm -hmm. Iowa and Oklahoma State as the next two in. Now, what we want to do this week, we want to look at the three scariest, I guess is the word we're going to use for that, the three scariest matchups we think for Ohio State. And then a dark horse team, who knows what that means. <laughs> yeah, we, we couldn't even really figure it out. Just, I guess, double-digit ranking. I know mine is, but... Who are your three scariest matchups for Ohio State? And a little bit about why. All right, my number, my number one's Clemson, and basically because I think Deshaun Watson is a very good quarterback. They've beaten down a lot of good teams this year. They really deserve the number one ranking. They, well. They're 10-0. I mean, I, the, the one thing that Ohio State struggled with this entire year is every time they've come up against a running quarterback, it, it's not gone well for them. And Ohio State has a little bit, with Urban Meyer, has a little bit of a history against Clemson. I think that would be fascinating. Um, number two, Alabama. They're really out. They're an Alabama team. They For two. Ohio State. Yeah, Ohio State played them last year. I don't. I don't expect the game to to be uh, much different. It'll be very close the whole game. Uh, number three, I'm going to go Oklahoma. I don't. Did we hit it three for three? You got the exact same. Wow, teams. that is incredible. Okay, give me your Oklahoma take. Well, I'd like to give everybody's take. Give me your Oklahoma take. Uh, because when I was going up and down the list, they're really the only team that I thought had the chance, had the talent, and had the talent to hang with Ohio State. I, I mean, Notre Dame is a good team. Oklahoma State's 10 and 0, but I don't think they're the best team in the Big 12. I really think Oklahoma. It really depends on which team Oklahoma, which Oklahoma team shows up. But Baker Mayfield is a good quarterback. They have a lot of good. They have a lot of good running backs. Their defense. Their defense has always been good. Bob Soup is a good coach. They're just 
They're they're a classic good Oklahoma team. Correct. Uh, I had the exact same three teams. Wow. Clemson. I do think Deshaun Watson would give Ohio State trouble with his ability to run the football. I also think Wayne Gallman, their running back, has been busting off some big runs this season. That could be a very devastating play in a game against Ohio State if they were to bust off a big run. Plus, they have a very good defensive line, something that people really don't know about because Deshaun Watson takes that spotlight. Alabama, Derrick Henry scares the living daylights out of me. I still don't know why Lane Kiffin didn't give him the ball more a year ago against Ohio State, but they're... They're just coming together at the right time. Their defensive front seven is absolutely ridiculous. And then Oklahoma as well. It's a two-dimensional offense, as we saw last week, on the road against Baylor. Baker Mayfield, very talented. Samaj P. Ryan, a guy that can run the ball really well. And if they make enough plays on defense, then they can win a game. Dark horse team. My dark horse, I, I, it's really been my dark horse the entire year, and I don't even want to say it really. It's, it's a team that I've wanted to say might hang with Ohio State more than most people would suspect, but obviously with injuries it won't happen. And that's TCU. They're number 18 now. They have two losses. I thought you were down on them. I, I thought you I thought have, that they were I great. have been down on them, even when even at the beginning of the season when they were in the top two. But they're, re- they're a really good matchup for Ohio uh, against Ohio State. Trayvon Boykin is exactly what Ohio State struggled with this entire year. And prior to all the injuries, their defense was good, really good. Fair enough. My dark horse team was Baylor, and until Seth Russell got hurt, they were a team that scared the living daylights out of me, just like Alabama did because of how explosive their offense was, how they can get the ball to Corey Coleman or Katie Cannon on the edge, and they can make plays. I think Jay Lee's their third receiver. He's extremely talented as well. Shock Linwood in the backfield. Seth Russell would have been just – he's perfect for that offense because a quarterback that just has good Mm straight-line speed – gives that offense another dimension that just makes them unstoppable. I was afraid of Ohio State's third and fourth corners trying to make stops on an island against Baylor's receivers. I feel like Ohio State could have scored with them, but now that Jared Stidham has taken over, I don't see them as as much of a threat. I don't know that they're going to even make the playoff at this point, but Uh, they were a scary team I don't think they. I don't think they can, and personally, I just never really thought Baylor would match up great against Ohio State. Why is that? Because I think Ohio State's defense is just – Spectacular! I've been on, I've been such a proponent of this defense at every single position. And I think you're right. The 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 depth at cornerback might hurt Ohio State a little bit, but with Damon Webb back, I think that helps a lot. If they were to play Baylor, which in this you know this universe is basically impossible unless Ohio State loses and not in the playoff, because I don't think Baylor would get in the playoff. But TCU in the playoff is also impossible. So. That's very true. So, anyways, those are our top three scariest matchups. We'll look to see if there are any shakeups come playoff time. Michigan State number nine. So, if they lose or win, they'll get bumped. And then we have some other top ten matchups coming up this week. And we're going to talk about Michigan State, Ohio State. Our guest this week to help us break down the Ohio State Michigan State football game is Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. Before we get into talking about the game, I wanted to talk a little bit about his book, The Chase, how Ohio State captured the first college football playoff. It's a great book. I mean, Bill, I know you tweeted out about how there aren't very many copies out there anymore, so you look at that as a good thing, correct? Yeah, well, there are plenty of copies out there. There are none left in the uh, Triumph Books warehouse in Chicago, which is which is good because uh, uh, that means they're on their way to stores or in stores. Uh, but uh, and there's a reprint, second printing, that's uh, soon to replenish their their warehouse. So uh, you should be able to get a book, but if you uh, want one soon and you want to be assured of getting one, I would suggest getting to a bookstore soon or going on Amazon and getting one soon. Absolutely, I'd say that it's very, it's well worth the read, just given how roller co- how much of a roller coaster this past season was. And looking at the content of the book, it seemed to sort of focus more on the personalities than the players, or the personalities behind the players. Why is it that you went about that sort of uh, perspective with the book? Well, a couple of reasons. One, I just think that's more interesting. Uh, I think it's much more interesting to talk about people and describe their journeys than it is to just talk about who they are as football players. And secondly, people people know what happened in the field. Everyone watched it. And so even though I provide, I do provide details about the games, the key plays in every in every significant game. Um, but I just felt like doing a resuscitation of, of all these, of, <laughs> resuscitation that is, of, of every play in every game kind of defeated the purpose. So I really wanted to emphasize the, the people, the personalities, and, and the obstacles they overcame to form this championship team. Yeah, and 
obviously Ohio State went, like Dan said, he, they went through a lot of turmoil last year and through three quarterbacks. I mean, that's that's a lot of that's that's very exciting from a fan's perspective that how it turned out. But was there a lot? Did you have to work to dig a lot in um, access wise to, to get the get the uh, personality details that you wanted to? Or since they won, was it more easy for you to get in there and get all the details that you wanted to? Well, it was a lot of work to try to get everybody uh, to do all those interviews. I probably interviewed 50, 50 people, every assistant coach, uh, Urban Meyer twice for like five hours, uh, almost every key player. The only players I didn't talk to were Devin Smith because we could just never hook up, and, and Braxton Miller, who just was kind of on media silence all year, understandably. Yep. But every other player I talked to, and, and yeah, it takes some time to arrange it, and Jerry Emmings from Ohio State was great in helping me. Uh, it helped that I had done Buckeye Report two years ago, so the coaches at least knew uh, what kind of book I was probably going to do, and, and they were more than happy to cooperate. Uh, but yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of work and a lot of time, And but I, I felt it was the only way to do it. I, I just didn't want to do a rehash. I didn't want to rely on my I don't, all the reporting that I've done covering the team for the dispatch. I wanted to make it fresh and original, and to do that, you just have to, you have to do that. You have to arrange these interviews and, and for the most part it went pretty smoothly there were a few players that it was a little tricky to pin down but but they were all great i mean the thing that was really underrated about that team last year was how insightful they were how mature they were it was really uh, kind of a revelation when i got a chance to really talk with them in depth and just how much depth there really was to those guys uh, you talk about the t- the title of your book which is the chase which was obviously the team's slogan a year ago and it just seemed like that team had a lot of fun, and they were just really brought together by all of the hurdles that they had to deal with throughout the season. Now it's the slogan is the grind, and it doesn't look like the team's having fun. And maybe that's because the schedule's been kind of bland thus far, but do you get a sense, I know you're around the team a fair amount, do you get the sense that this team is having fun like they were a year ago? It just doesn't seem that way to me. Yeah, I think they are having fun. I think most of the pressure, I mean, they do feel the pressure. Urban Meyer alluded to that the other day. There's no question. When you're the un- un- unanimous number one team heading into the season, there's pressure. And the quarterback situation going back and forth has, has added to that to some degree. I think the fact they have not blown out teams the way most people expected them to is another factor. But, but I think they're having fun. They're colleges. I think they're fairly insulated. I think the coaches do a pretty good job of, of trying to keep the outside world out as much as possible. Now, their college students are on campus all the time, so they, they can't be uh, completely removed from that. But I, I do think they're having fun. I think there is absolutely truth, though, that it is a grind. There's no question that this year has been much more of a, of a challenge in terms of just kind of plowing through. And part of that is because, like you said, there, there haven't been a lot of compelling games other than Virginia Tech because of the revenge issue and being the opener and the drama about who would be the quarterback. Most of these games, you, could, you go to the game and you pretty much know they're going to win. So I'm sure for players, as much as they do that whole one game at a time thing, they have to know that they're so uh, physically superior to their opponents that they're going to win. And, and now you finally are going to be playing a couple games uh, from now on, you'll be playing teams that, that certainly are your caliber or close to it. Yeah, and since you've been around the team so much, you said it's been it's been a grind this year. It, like you said, there's the the games have not been they, they have not been playing the typical opponents that that could really challenge them and win a game. But do you see a no, a noticeable change in their attitude this week with college game day coming to town in Michigan State. This is a team that it was a huge game last year, and it seemed like it pushed Ohio State over the hurdle nationally. Is there, is there some sort of difference in intensity this week? I think it's been ramped up. I think it'll be ramped up even more next week against Michigan because it's Michigan. Uh, but yeah, I, and I think that they're looking forward to it. I think they get probably a little bored with with playing the the. You know, Illinois to the world. I mean, I think that, that unless Ohio State really laid an egg, they were going to win that game. Unless something really bizarre happened, they were going to win. And so to, to actually be able to test yourself, okay, how good are we really against a team like Michigan State, I think that's fun for them. That's, what's with, that's why they come to Ohio State, to, for those kind of, of challenges. Uh, talking about the matchup with Michigan State coming up this weekend, uh, something that we were on a little bit early was that Michigan State – looks like they're constructed like a normal Big Ten team. And I I mean that, like, they're very talented up front. They have a good offensive line, good defensive line, but maybe not the best skill guys. 
And I feel like Ohio State's one of those teams, one of the few in the nation that can neutralize what they do up front. And I do think that it's a bit of a mismatch coming up this game just based off of Ohio State's skill talent. Am I correct in that assessment? Well, kind of. Uh, they have very good receivers, played by Aaron Burbridge. Their running backs or their running game has, has kind of sputtered this year, and a lot of that's because the offensive line's had a lot of injuries and, and they haven't really been settled there. So it's not a typical Michigan State run game like they've had the past few years. Um, but they do have talent. They're much more of a passing team with Connor Cook, and again, who knows how effective he can be on Saturday with the shoulder injury. We'll just have to wait and see. On defense, they're very good up front. They've had some injuries in the, in the back end, so they might be vulnerable to the deeper pass. Uh, but Ohio State's not been real consistent completing that. So that's going to be one of the, the challenges of the game. Uh, Ohio State's got to be able to establish the run somewhat. They've, the run run game has been pretty good for Ohio State. Obviously, Ezekiel Elliott's a great running back. But Michigan State's the best defensive line they're going to play. Mm-hmm. And are you anxious to see what area that Ohio, that Michigan State can test Ohio State in? Because... Like we've, like we've been really touching on, that Ohio State hasn't really played it that difficult of a schedule. There's been a lot, there's been a few areas that I think Ohio State's slid by and, and hasn't been tested through 10 games, which is a little bit unusual. Is there something that you're, is it, is it the offensive line that needs to, sh- needs to show up and have a great game against Michigan State for them to win? Yeah, I wrote today in today's dispatch about how the, the line has struggled to protect, uh, how the line struggled to protect Barrett last week, and, and that certainly was an issue. He, he seldom had time to sit back in the pocket, just kind of scan the field. And no quarterback, when they're under duress, is going to be very effective, and, and JT Barrett wasn't. And he's not the tallest guy, so he's a little trouble seeing over linemen anyway. And when you have the pocket collapse, it's almost impossible. So that's, that's one thing that Ohio State really has to prove. They have to be able to throw the ball consistently downfield and not just swing passes and not just rely on Elliott's running. Uh, looking at the spread for this game, Ohio State comes into this one a 13-point favorite at home, which uh, being at home, obviously it's going to increase the spread a little bit, but 13 seems a little steep for playing the ninth team in the nation, but when that happens, you always feel like maybe Vegas knows something that we don't. Do you feel like that's a fair spread, or do you feel like maybe it's a little bit inflated? I think that takes into account the uncertainty with Connor Cook. I think if people, if it was no question that Connor Cook was completely healthy, I, I would guess it'd be more like a, I don't know, eight or nine point spread maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not, I really don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that, that that certainly has affected things. Cause I think there's a feeling if Connor Cook doesn't play at all or isn't, if he can't play or gets hurt early, the Michigan State doesn't have much of a chance and it could get ugly. So I think that probably factors into it all as well. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier that you that the Michigan game, you think uh, the intensity is going to ramp up this week and then ramp up even more next week. I was thinking when I what is when you're ranking Ohio State against Michigan State, University of Michigan, or Iowa, which of them pre- presents the biggest challenge to Ohio State? Because in my opinion, I think it's Michigan, and I think I think that's going to be the closest game out of all three of them. But do you think that Michigan State's that second rank, or do you think that they're they're really the third, the third base game, and Iowa's going to present a more, per, per, uh, more, a, a better challenge. That was a terrible yeah. question. <laughs> no, well, I think I think if Connor Cook's healthy, then Michigan State's probably equal to Michigan. If he's not, then I'd say it probably is less challenging than Iowa. I think Michigan going up there is always Ohio State never blows them out in Michigan, even when. Michigan's had terrible teams the past you know, decade or so. Kate Forcey. Ohio State, yeah, Ohio State's always had tough games there. Um, Jim Harbaugh, first-year coach, obviously, the, the whole 1969 specter. I know you're way, way too young for that, and so am I, actually. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, that memory lingers with older Ohio State fans. It's this unbelievable uh, team defending national champion from 1968. They go up there, and they just get their butts kicked. And so there's always that trepidation, could, could history repeat. And Michigan is a much better team than most people thought they'd be at the end of the year. I think that they may have peaked a little early. I'm not sure they've played great lately. But I have every reason to think that Jim Harbaugh will have those guys ready to play, and they'll be, uh, it'll be a frenzy game next week. It'll be, it'll be crazy. All right, Bill, uh, we normally like to end shows with giving the guests the opportunity to pick the game, so what do you think the final score will be? Well, I'll, I'll go with what I had in the paper. I, I picked uh, Ohio State 31-20. to 20. 
kind of hedged my bets a little bit because I didn't know uh, Cook's status. And, and mm-hmm. if, if he doesn't play, I think it'll be more along the lines of 31-10. If he does play and is effective, then it could be a 31-28 kind of thing. But, um, you know, I think Michigan State certainly has the front seven on defense to, to uh, slow down Ohio State and make it a game. And then uh, the other factor is that Michigan State's much better on, with turnovers than Ohio State is. And if Ohio State can neutralize that, I think they're in pretty good shape. But if it's a game where Ohio State turns the ball over three times, they could be in some trouble. Yep, their plus 13 turnover margin is third best in the NCAA. So that could be an area of concern, as it has been for Ohio State. Moving forward, uh, that was this Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, his book is The Chase, How Ohio State Captured the First College Football Playoff. He has been our guest on the show from the shoe. Bill, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Our pleasure. That was Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. You can pick up his book, The Chase, at your local bookstore. Or uh, Amazon. Or Amazon when they get more copies. But anyways, he picked a 31-20 to final, and something that hasn't really been taking into account a lot of places that I've seen is that Connor Cook might be struggling, but, you know, I think he's going to play. Yeah, I think I fully assume that he's going to play. I'm really – that never really crept into my mind that he wouldn't play because this is the biggest game of the year. He's a competitor. Mm -hmm. What's your score prediction? I think Ohio State's going to win, and I'm really interested to see yours because you've been uh, against Michigan State the entire year. But I'm going to pick Ohio State 35-17. to I think that's Ohio big, State. It, it is a big cover. It is a big victory for Ohio State, and I, I, there's a, been a lot of people who I think have said this is time that Ohio State has to have a big one. They have to show that the eye test, the eye test is correct. Ohio State is as good as people think they are. But I don't think it really matters how how much Ohio State wins by. They just need a win, and they're going to get in. But I think they will win big. I completely agree with you. I think there is a worry that I have that Ohio State might come out in this game a bit flat. Just because they well, haven't they have every single game this correct. Year. Plus, they haven't been, they haven't gotten up for every single team that they've played to this point, and it's kind of hard to just flip a switch, no matter how talented you are. So, I think Ohio State might come out a bit flat. The score might not be where I want it to be, or where people will want it to be, and just based off my pick in the first quarter or after the first quarter. But I do think Ohio State runs away with this game. I think they have way too much talent for Michigan State. I think they have way too much skill talent. Their Very much front agree. can neutralize anything that Michigan State does. Michigan State can't run the football. There's nothing that they do really well that gives me any pause in making a pick of Ohio State 41-17. to 17. Wow. I'll give you a little right. bit greater. I think Ohio right. State takes care of business. Now, I've been picking them big every single week, so why stop now, I guess, when they're finally no, playing a halfway decent team? Yeah, I listen. I'm 35. We're seven points. We're we are six. seven point. Oh, six point difference. Six points. Six point difference. And I am. I mean, I'm really. I don't think that Michigan State's going to keep it close. And I, I'm. I'm just on the JT Barrett Ezekiel. This defense is incredible bandwagon. Well, we'll just have to see if we're right or not. And you can watch that game at 3:30 on ABC. College game day will be in Columbus. I won't be there. You. We'll find out later. TBD. All right, so if you're there, look for Colin because he could possibly be there. He might also not be there, so maybe you shouldn't spend as much time looking for Colin. But anyways, that has been this edition of the show from the shoe. Again, Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. His book is The Chase. Pick it up in your bookstores. For Colin Hassel, I'm Dan Herbener. We'll see you next week.